In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, in silence, let us remember God's presence with us now. O God, our Father, we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved thee with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, we beseech thee. Cleanse us from our sins, and help us to overcome our faults. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto us pardon and remission of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to the Queen's College Virtual Chapel for our penultimate service this term as we mark the season of Lent. Let us pray. Almighty God, who seest that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from Genesis 12. The Call of Abram The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moray. And Shashem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received the power of procreation, even though he was too old. And Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This week, 18 people were discovered in the back of a refrigerated lorry just outside Peterborough. Thankfully, they were all alive and unharmed. Many others, of course, have not been so fortunate. And we're told that the displacement of people, whether that's through individual migration or the large-scale resettlement of whole communities, is only going to increase as the result of environmental pressures, such as flooding, pressure on land, and conflict over natural resources. Migration is nothing new. The history of our languages is the history of the movement of peoples. 
And it's by no means always the case that the story behind it is one of desperation, that the push factors are greater than the pull factors. On the contrary, it's often those who are at most risk by staying put, the very old, the very young, the very poor, who are those least able to make a journey of hundreds of miles or to afford to pay thousands of dollars to people traffickers, still less to obtain the kind of jobs and visas which would make it possible to relocate safely and legally. People can become migrants almost by accident. I'm thinking of friends who moved countries to study or for a gap year and one year became five and five years became ten, became a lifetime. When did their old st country stop being home? When did they mentally stop living in tents and start to put down roots? Others migrate in their hearts long before they actually cross any borders. Of late, uh, it seems that New Zealand is cropping up in conversation quite a bit when talking to people about their dreams for the future. And in the latest lockdown, even I've found myself noticing the occasional adverts in the Church Times for clergy in the Diocese of Dunedin or Auckland. And this year, the UK is preparing for what's been called the largest planned migration to this country since the Windrush generation. Over 500 churches have already signed up as Hong Kong-ready churches as we prepare to welcome between 100,000 and 300,000 people from Hong Kong. What those who migrate have in common is the desire for something better, whether for themselves or for future generations. And in that sense, the story of Abram, also known as Abraham, stands for the story of all who have migrated. There's much he's leaving behind, his country, his people, the land his father knew. But there's also much he's taking with him, his wife, his nephew, and in his case also significant wealth and possessions. But most of all, he's God. Unlike many other faiths and spiritual traditions, Christianity is not tied to specific sacred features of the land, to a river Ganges or an Uluru. If God is creator of the universe, then God is equally at home everywhere, or equally not at home. But this is something which takes Abraham and his descendants many generations, many exiles and homecomings to fully grasp. What have you left behind in life? And what have you taken with you? A woman whose husband is a diplomat told me the other day, it's the little things. I still put my toothbrush in the same mug I was using 10 years ago. That's what she's taken with her. Home is where your tooth mug is. That experience of being dislocated, of being not at home, is an experience that most of us have had or will have on some level. There's no comparison between the dramatic or traumatic experience of those who've arrived in Oxford having crossed continents as refugees and those who perhaps are here on a student visa or whose home is the other end of the X90 bus route. And yet, one of the joys and privileges of Oxford is how quickly this transient, international, ever-changing community comes to feel like home. For those of you currently not here or preparing to move on at the end of next term, that may be feeling very real and bittersweet right now. And it's also the fact that we share that experience of being not quite at home. How even a small thing like comparing your Christmas day with a friend's and realizing that not every family does things the way yours does can be a little culture shock in miniature. Perhaps part of our feeling of alienation sometimes comes from overestimating how at home other people feel and for that matter, overvaluing it. One of the things we're missing out on right now is the opportunity to spend time abroad and to be immersed in a different way of living. And I'm thinking particularly right now of those students in modern languages and in Oriental studies who were due to be spending this year abroad. 
Our creation justice speaker last week grew up in Germany and she was passionate that if we English folk could only experience life as it is in Germany, we would see that a more environmentally responsible lifestyle is not just feasible, but actually goes hand in hand with a better quality of living. But the value of being not at home is not just that of seeing another culture, but of being seen by that culture. To have the experience of being an alien, to use the American terminology. There's a value in feeling out of place, of asking whether maybe it's me who's the weird one. I was fascinated to read a study which suggested that in international negotiations, there can be an advantage to speaking in your second or third language, perhaps because that greater detachment from your own thoughts helps you to express them more deliberately. But I'm even more impressed by those couples who learn to express their deepest selves to one another in a language which is not the language of their childhood, especially if that language comes with very different cultural conventions around the expressions of anger or passion or respect. It brings you face to face with big questions about how much of your identity is a product of your culture. Does it reinforce your commitment to your own values or lead you to question them? What are you going to take with you and what are you going to leave behind? It might seem as though right now we're in the complete opposite situation to Abraham, unable to travel, unable to leave home. The only way in which we are journeying on by stages is on the Prime Minister's roadmap out of lockdown. But in another way, all of us are experiencing that dislocation. We're all strangers and aliens in a world we don't yet quite know how to navigate. We're all experiencing now those challenges which have long been familiar to those who have grown up in international schools, of trying to maintain friendship groups across distance and time zones. And I don't think any of us feel that Zoom etiquette is our native culture. And it's raising a lot of the same questions for us about what we need to take with us from the life we had before and what we want to leave behind. In Lent, this 40-day wilderness wandering, we embrace that sense of discomfort, of being unsettled. We remember, too, that we follow a migrant God. God has identified himself with those who are homeless or far from home, not just in his choice of his chosen people, the Jews, accompanying them through migration, through exile, through diaspora, but also in his own act of migration, his incarnation, his choice in Jesus not to be at home in heaven, however you understand that, but to make his home on earth amongst humankind amongst the people to whom he was constantly a stranger and an alien, one misunderstood and rejected. Ruth Valerio, who was our first preacher in this term's creation justice season, in her book Saying Yes to Life, sounds a note of caution about this Christian spiritual emphasis on being sojourners, strangers and aliens on the earth, just passing through. She warns that the legacy of seeing this planet as not our true home has been a narrow interpretation of the Christian mission and has contributed to our failure to live up to our responsibilities to this planet. But I think there's a different and a more positive way of being strangers on the earth. I've only had the briefest experience of living in a different country, a 10-week exchange trip to a university in northern Romania, but my abiding memory of that time was of hospitality. I was so thankful for the welcome extended to me. And that's a sentiment echoed often by an older generation of people who moved to this country over the 20th century. Surprisingly, perhaps, given that the welcome extended to them often fell far short of a Christian or even a humane response. For many people, the experience of being strangers and aliens is one of gratitude, thankfulness for the opportunities we found, a reminder never to take for granted the life we have. So perhaps that is what we mean this Lent, when we follow our 
migrant God in being strangers and aliens upon the land. That in this discomfort of feeling out of place, we remember that we are guests on an earth that is not our own. Amen.
Let us pray. God, our creator, you made the heavens and the earth. No boundaries of natural landscape or of human politics can divide or constrain you. Wherever we are right now, and however uncertain the path ahead may look, make us know that no journey we make can ever take us further from you, or bring us closer to you than you are to each one of our brothers and sisters on the planet we share. God, our Redeemer, Watch over all those who are far from home today, those who have no home, or who feel their home is no longer a place of safety or of freedom, and those who do not feel at home or welcome in the place they live. Praying especially for those citizens of Hong Kong preparing for a new life in the UK, and ten years after the earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand, all those who lost their homes or for whom home will never be the same again. Be a path to those who wander, a shelter to those who have no roof, a safe harbour to those who are adrift. God, our comforter, send your abundant blessing on this college, our home, as we bring before you all the concerns that are on our hearts as a community those who have exams starting next week, all who are standing for election to the JCR exec, all those decisions and practicalities facing the college as we interpret and implement the rules for the coming months. As you send your blessing on us, so equip us to be a blessing to all places and people with whom we have to do. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all them that are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Next week we'll be hearing from our final preacher in our creation justice season, Joe Chamberlain, National Environment Officer for the Church of England. And we have two more Tuesday evening speaker events. This coming Tuesday, the 2nd of March, Makbul Rahim will be sharing his experiences of how faith can be used to change environmental practices within Muslim communities. And on the 9th of March, rescheduled from earlier in term, we'll be hearing from psychologist Dr. Adam Bamel on environmentalism and the gods. If you're not a member of Queen's, please do sign up to the mailing list to receive invitations to all online events. Let us pray. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen.